Welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at finite groups and mostly to develop some terminology that will be useful for working with these a bit later. And we'll also talk a little bit about subgroups, what it means for a group to be inside another group and how we can describe that. Okay, so the first terminology is just the, the name for the size of a group. So we've seen groups already that have infinitely many elements and we've seen groups with finitely many elements and the, the, the order of a group is just the number of elements in it. So for example, if I take the integers z, which under addition, so sometimes I'll write z plus just to make explicit what the group operation is, but most of the time we'll just leave the set with the understanding of the operation just implied because it's the only one we're likely to be using on integers. So z plus, well this doesn't have a finite, a finite number of elements, so we'd say z plus has infinite order. Or if we take a finite group, so we could take u of 12, which we looked at previously, the order of this one is equal to 4, because if we remember back to what that one means, u of 12 is the set of numbers relatively prime to 12, i.e. numbers that have no common factor with 12 apart from 1, that are less than 12, which is just the elements 1, 5, 7, and 11. Okay, so groups can have finitely many elements, in which case they have a finite order, or a group could have infinitely many elements, in which case we say it has infinite order. Right, so it's not just groups that can have orders. Elements within a groups have an order as well, although the meaning here is a little bit different. So the order of an element little g is the smallest positive integer n such that g to the n is equal to that entity. Or if we were to use additive notation, n times g equals zero. And if you, there is no n that gets us back to the, to the identity, then we say that g has infinite order. So perhaps the easiest way to discuss this is to look at a couple of examples. So we'll first look at an example from GL2R, which is the set of invertible 2 by 2 matrices. So I'm going to choose the matrix A to be 0, 1, 1, 0, which I claim is a member of GL2R. How would I check this? Well, I just calculate its determinant, right? So the determinant of A... is just 0 times 0 minus 1 times 1 is negative 1, which is not equal to 0, therefore A is a member of this set. Now if I take A, if I want to find its order, I just need to keep multiplying it by itself until I get back to the identity. So A squared, well, that's actually exactly what we want, is the identity equals I. Okay, if uh, I don't need to go any further, so I say that the order of A, note the notation is uh, sorry, the order of A with an O is equal to 2 here. Okay, note we have an infinite group. There are infinitely many invertible matrices with, with real entries in 2 by 2, but we have an element with finite order, so that's a thing that can happen. For our second example, let's now go to the positive rationals under multiplication. So Q plus under multiplication. So these are all the positive rational numbers. Remember rational numbers are numbers that can be formed as fractions of integers. Okay, so what do we got here? Well, essentially we're going to look at the order of every single element in Q+. So let A be an element of Q+. It's going to be a positive number, it's going to be greater than zero, and it's going to be rational. If a is less than 1, then what's going to happen if we take powers of a? Well, every time we multiply by a, a squared is going to be less than 1 also, and slightly closer to 0. a cubed is going to be closer to 0 again, and that's going to continue on. So we'll have that a to the power of n is between 0 and 1 for all natural numbers n. Okay. Natural numbers is just another word for positive integers and I use that n symbol for it. Okay, so if a is less than 1, no matter what it is, a has infinite order. If a is greater than 1, same kind of thing happens. If a is bigger than 1, a squared is also going to be bigger than 1 and slightly larger than a, 
a cubed is going to be larger again, and the same kind of thing is going to apply. This time, a is going to be greater than 1 and less than a to the power of n. In both cases, a has infinite order. And if a equals 1, so if a is not equal to 1, a has infinite order. If a equals 1, the order of a is just equal to 1. The order of the identity in any group is just equal to 1 because the identity to the power of 1 is just equal to the identity, funnily enough. Okay, and for our last example, we'll go to one that we'll be using quite often, um, and I'm going to look at Z10. Again, whenever I'm using Z10, I'm always going to be using addition modulo 10. I'll just make it, make it explicit here, although normally I won't bother to do that. We'll just The operation will be inferred from the fact that we're using Z10. So what are the orders of 3 and 4? There's our question. Okay, so essentially what we're going to do is we're just going to take multiples of 3. That looks weird. Let's make it 3n and 4n. So I'm just going to take successive add 3 on numerous times. We'll just put a row of n's across here. We're in Z10, so the most we're ever going to do is 10 of them. So essentially, we're just going to keep adding 3's on until we get to the, ident the identity. And what is the identity for Z10? Well, we're in an additive group. The identity for Zn is always equal to 0. So I'm just going to add 3's until I get 0. So 3 1's are 3, 3 2's are 6, 3 3's are 9, 3 4's are 12. Now we're in mod 10, so we go back to 2. By subtracting 10, add 3 again, I get 5, add 3 again, I get 8, add 3 again, I get 1. Okay, again, I go mod 10, add 3, I get 4, add 3, I get 7, add 3, I get 10, which is 0. So the order of 3 is 10. Okay, I need to add 10 of them together before I get back to 0. Now we'll go to 4. 4 1's are 4, 4 2's are 8, 4 3's are 12, which becomes 2, plus 4 is 6, plus 4 is 10, which is 0. So 4, we get there quick, more quickly, so the order of 4 is equal to 5. Okay, so every group, every element in every group has an order. It may be infinite, it may be finite. Um, if we have an infinite group, like the matrices we had before, we can have elements with finite order. But if we have a finite group, and we'll prove this later on, the element, we cannot have elements of infinite order. Um, but we'll talk about what the elements of orders of finite group, uh, what the orders of elements of finite group can be in a little bit more depth later on. The last thing that I want to discuss in this video is subgroups. Now we'll actually launch into this properly in the next one, but we wanted to get the sort of definition out of the way first. So this is the notion that a group can contain other groups. Much like when we first looked at complex numbers, we saw we could take the subset of 1, negative 1, i, and negative i, and they formed a group just in and of themselves. So the definition is, if a subset h of a group is itself a group, and here's the key part, um, under the same group operation as g, okay, so we can't have a set that, ha that is a group under a different operation, then we say that h is a subgroup of g. And we have some notation for this. We could say we write h is less than or equal to g. Okay, so by this, uh, the less than or equal is quite suggestive. It means that, for example, g is a subgroup of itself. That's, that's, that's allowed. If we want to exclude that case, just like we do with the less than symbol, we can write h is less than g. This is a proper subgroup. Okay, so it cannot be g itself. So sometimes we want to use that notation. And the smallest subgroup that we have, and every group has this subgroup, is the set which just contains the identity. Remember, if the axioms of groups, one of them is that it contains an identity element, so we can't have an empty group. This is the smallest group we can make, and it is a subgroup of every group, so we call this one the trivial subgroup.
Okay, so if we want to test for these, and again, we'll talk about this in greater depth in the next video, but just very quickly, we get a few things for free. Okay, remember to, to establish that a set is a group, it has to be associative. Well, the group operation of G is associative automatically because G is a group, therefore any subset of it will, will also have the same associativity. So associativity comes for free from the parent group. Okay, so we don't need to check associativity if we've already got a group that we're inside. Um, similarly, the identity must be the same one. as for G. Okay, so any subgroup, the, ident the identity will be the same identity. You might want to have a bit of a think about why exactly that is. So to establish um, that H is a subgroup, we one of the things we often do first is to check that the identity is in it, and we'll talk more about that later. So the things we need to check, we need to check closure. That means if we take two elements and compose them together, sure, we'll, we'll stick inside G, but we want to make sure that we stay inside H under the group operation. And we also need to take check what happens if we take inverses. Okay, so if I take a subset of matrices and I take the identity, because we know we need that, and one other matrix, but its inverse is not in my subset, then it won't be a subgroup. So we need to check closure under inverses. So that's the basic set of things that we need to talk to consider when we're testing whether a subset of a group is in fact a subgroup. So in the next video we'll discuss how exactly we go about doing this and a few different sort of shortcuts to testing subgroups. And until then, uh, we'll see you next time.